Yes, I'll give you a quick run through of uh, what we'll be doing this year. Um, plans for the field season are, as ever, going back to our main trench, Trench P, where we have some of these amazingly beautiful, upstanding Neolithic buildings. And we'll be continuing work on the floors, in many cases the primary floors of many of these structures, including Structure 1, Structure 8, Structure 10, and hopefully Structure 12. Structure 14 has now been completed, looks a bit sad for itself, but uh, we're now working hard on all the post-excavation, trying to bring together the very detailed story of uh, that building. But we'll also be returning to Trench X, this kind of elongated trench that heads down towards the, the Lock of Stenness. And uh, a couple of years ago, when we had it open, we discovered a series of actual post holes, which seem to define part of a structure. So this year we'll be extending the trench, something I say we'll never ever do ever again, but inevitably we always do extend, but uh, just a little extension, not very big in terms of what, uh, in terms of the nest, but enough to hopefully get the full uh, outline plan of this uh, post structure, but also to get some dating evidence for this post structure, because unfortunately all the, the postals so far have not played the game and haven't produced any suitable dating. Uh, samples. We'll also be going back to Trench T, this uh, amazing uh, trench which to begin with always looked like the sad little sister to the main trench, but Trench T in many ways has surpassed itself. Trench T, this massive monumental midden mound, uh, which uh, again will be extending slightly. Uh, just to try and get to grips with this uh, extraordinary, unique structure that seems to lie at the base of the sequence. And uh, a bit closer look at it, this structure 27, with its very peculiar, very unique form of architecture. Uh, but joining the dots, we think this is roughly the outline of it, but probably by the end of this year that will have changed totally once again. <coughs> Um, and you might remember last year I spoke about this structure perhaps being the Arcadian equivalent of a early Neolithic timber hall. Well, um, slight change of theories. Um, it does have certain elements which seem to be akin to uh, the chamber tomb of Buchan. But just across the water at How of How, big brock site that was dug back in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, at the very base of the sequence here, beneath all the Brock structures and beneath a maze how type chamber too, there was this peculiar structure, which at the time was interpreted as being maybe a stalled chamber too. But I think that uh, interpretation is a bit questionable. But there's certain elements of this which makes me think, yes, maybe structure 27 at the nest has a bit more in common with uh, this stalled structure at How of How. We'll also be doing further work in Trench J, one of our original trenches that we only returned to a couple of years ago to look at Structure 5, this large oval structure, which judging by the architecture uh, dates to somewhere in the early Neolithic. How early, we're unsure of. Again, we have to get down onto the primary floors. But last year, we extended the trench slightly. You can see the kind of join. Um, and, uh, this hopefully now we have the, the whole outline of structure five in plan. So this year we'll be excavating down into the middle of it and round about and uh, see what the real nature of it is like. But also looking at the relationship between structure five and the surrounding so-called Great Wall of Brodga. Because last year there was indications that maybe the two were contemporary. And the Great Wall, which I'd always thought of as being a later addition, is in fact maybe one of the primary elements of the nest. But watch this space. But anyway, on to the main uh, thrust of the, the, the talk this evening, the appliance of science. <coughs> I've gone one too far. Um, in many people's mind, archaeology is still a bunch of dirty diggers digging in the mud and uh, just discovering things discovering artifacts, looking for treasure. But science, over, particularly over the last 50 years, but it's even more so over the last 20 years, has become much more uh, apparent in archaeology. 
and it really permeates every level of what we do archaeologically. And this really starts with uh, the discovery of sites, for instance, the Ness itself. And uh, this is through the use of geophysics. And uh, we're glad to hear that finally the major geophysics program that started back in 2002 and now covers all of the World Heritage Area is heading towards final publication, we hope sometime next year. But that has been greatly aided by the input of uh, Professor Mark Edmonds. <coughs> so geophysics, and uh, as I said, we've now covered this huge area uh, right the way across the World Heritage Site. Apologies, many of you will have seen this slide before. But geophysics in Orkney, the underlying geology, is very susceptible to producing good results. Uh, but I don't think any of us expected to see the return that we've had on the geophysical survey. And as you see from this map, we've now covered a huge area all the way up from past the Ring of uh, Buchan, down past Ring of Broad, got all the way down the peninsula, out towards Maze Howe, and a large area also around Scarabray. And uh, I think I've used this uh, terminology before, but it's just showing that, you know, our, Orkney was not just populated by people in the past, it was populated by monuments. And we see this, just a few examples here, for instance, area around Scarabray. Looks like uh, not very much happening there, but apply geophysics to it, and there's still quite a bit more. Apart from Scarabray itself, which the geophysics suggests is a lot bigger than the area that's presently on show to the public, but also at this site, the powder nest, which is a brock site, which wasn't known about. So it just shows the scale of archaeology out there that's sometimes missed. I think we've just got too much archaeology in all. <laughs> and then the area around the stones of Stones. Again, what appears to be just green fields. But have a closer look, because the geophysics shows there's an awful lot more happening there. But the first two fields we did as part of the World Heritage Geophysics Programme was the two fields at the tip of the Brodka Peninsula. And this really gave us an inkling about the scale of what we might find. Because at the very tip, here we are in the two fields, you can start to make out, if this works, a lot happening. In, behind the, in between the kind of high general magnetic readings, you can start to see rectangular structures, oval structures, linear ones, concentric anomalies, etc., etc., etc. But that only gave us a hint of what was there. Because since the original geophysics was done back in 2002, techniques have developed at great speed, just like everything in technology. So we've improved the, the geophysics. We've done... Mm, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I think it just needs a little nudge. There we go. Right. Yes, we've, we've refined the geophysics using new techniques and doing kind of closer uh, scans of, the, of the, the ground and this again is magnetometry and again you can see the kind of the busyness of the results there is just so much there which sometimes makes it very difficult to actually interpret to kind of define uh, individual elements but uh, the geophysicists which I am not uh, managed to make sense of all this to me it's a, yet another black art but uh, no, it but uh, the geophysics hasn't just stopped. We've continued to do it, and we've been filling in the gaps. And a couple of years ago, we finally got round to do the, the front garden of the, the house at uh, Brodka Farm. And uh, surprise, surprise, there was a little bit of archaeology there. Doesn't look like much, but initially we thought that My computer screen says I have just reserved two seats on the 27th of August. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't think that was in my eye trip. Right. 
And initially, these geophysics results, if you kind of squint a bit, half close your eyes, we uh, thought that there was a structure such as that, maybe quite similar to structure 10, uh, actually, as ATMS, <coughs> big monumental structure. But uh, further analysis of the results showed something you know, a bit more compl complex going on. So uh, I think that is something that we shall leave for future generations to ponder and discover, kenting as it is. But it's not just magnetometry and resistivity we've been using, the kind of two mainstays of geophysics, but also GPR, ground penetrating radar, in kind of quite small targeted areas. And uh, this has kind of been very helpful in places to actually clarifying what's been going on. For instance, this certain area was where we thought the southern boundary wall went around towards the Lockerhari. But as we thought, thought there, there's, there is a break and it seems to be possible entrance. But uh, over the last couple of years, ground penetrating radar has came on in leaps and bounds as well. And uh, it is still quite a time consuming technique. But then just a month or so ago, I was approached by somebody with one of these. This is a drone that carries GPR underneath it. This is true wizardry, because he reckons he could do the whole of the Nessie Vodka, in fact, probably the whole of the Vodka Peninsula in just a couple of days. So we shall see. I've seen the, the results that he's uh, successfully brought to my attention from elsewhere. In fact, just now, he's working the Valley of the Kings. So uh, that's a pretty good recommendation. But also, we use aerial photography. It is a kind of science. And uh, aerial photography has kind of been forgotten about, and it's been kind of overlooked quite often in Orkney, again, just because we've got so much upstanding archaeology. But where it has been done, we see discoveries such as this, just across the road from the Ring of Buchan, a new enclosure, the new Buchan enclosure, just showing up as a crop mark. And, uh, but when we apply geophysics around it, you can see that uh, this was what showed up in the aerial photograph. But in fact, there's at least one other enclosure just over the back of it. And just whole post is, I think, the outline of quite an extensive settlement. And the, the work that Chris G has done uh, with his magic eye doing field walking would suggest that a lot of this is Neolithic in date as well. We also apply LIDAR, Light Detection and Ranging Survey, high resolution radar. And this can kind of give a new dimension to the landscape, but it's great, it complements what we're doing with the geophysics as well. And uh, on the kind of wider scale, uh, Crane Beck, who works for the Archaeology Institute at the college, um, he's been uh, doing a, a, a further study of some of it in, 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 uh, <coughs> to complement the, the geophysics. And as you can see for this, LIDAR can show you some very, very small variations in height. Things which are almost invisible to the human eye. But Crane's eye, when he plays around with all the, the, the data, um, can really pick up some very fine details and then you can go into the field and say, oh yes, well there should be an enclosure here, it should maybe be a ditch. You can't see it, but then you have to lie in the ground, squint along, and sure enough, it's there. So you get a sense from this image about some of the things which have been missed. For instance, the enclosure over overbigging seems to be the kind of focus for a whole set of uh, fuel systems. But every hump and bump and lump isn't necessarily archaeology, but on the other hand, knowing Orkney, it probably is. <laughs> um, and it's not just the land-based stuff that we've uh, been looking at. The work with by Caroline Wickham Jones and a team of the Rise and Tides project, we're kind of integrating what they've been doing underwater with what we've been doing on land. So this is part of, uh, uh, this is now quite a dated uh, image, I think it was well about 10, 10 years ago, but it does give you a sense of potentially what the, what the, the change in uh, landform would have been due to changing water levels. 
And uh, this was a, a map that Caroline produced, around about 5,000 Cal BP. And it shows that, yes, the area of the Loch of Stoness would have been a lot smaller with more land around the edges, including here at Vanessa Broadga. So slightly wider, but still acting as this kind of natural land bridge connecting them. And even today, this was a shot I took only oh, about a month ago, and you can still see this kind of uh, shelf that runs all the way along parallel to the shore at the, the, the Loch of Stoness. And uh, slightly later than that, about three, four weeks ago, I was out walking the dog, water levels were a bit lower, and there were some stones poking out. And this, I think, is an early site. This is actually sitting on that shelf that's now become inundated. Difficult to see here, but there are several large stones, but more importantly, what seems to be one, two, three upright stones, all right out of each other, associated with each other. But yeah, just, you can see it just poking through the water. So I was hoping for a dry summer, whether we're going to get that or not, we'll be yet to see. Whatever we do, though, we need a chronology to work to. It's always nice to have our thoughts kind of reinforced. And of course, radiocarbon dating is still the, really the mainstay of dating. And uh, initially, oh, about 10 years ago, the dates that we had from the nest suggested about 900 years of activity. But then we were very fortunate. We were approached by this big European project, the Times of the Lives, and uh, this uh, used lots of new dates, or provided us with lots of new dates, but also applying Bayesian analysis, Bayesian statistics to the results. And this has allowed quite a, much, quite a more detailed uh, story to evolve the nest. But having said that, what we've, what we've discovered, unfortunately, is that the nest, um, Despite the size of the excavations, you'd think we'd be inundated with you know, the number of suitable samples for dating. But in fact, they're relatively few and far between. We don't get much in the way of carbonized material that's suitable for radiocarbon. Uh, the bone preservation in the hole isn't that good. And there's various other factors which just make radiocarbon dating, like any dating, a bit more problematic. But it's still heartening that when we see all the dates put together, you still see that kind of basic sequence which we predicted oh, 10 years ago plus. So this is showing that yes, there's a, a, over 1,200 years of activity in the nest. And uh, this is supported now with the discovery of round-based pottery in one, one of the trenches, or maybe two of the trenches. So going right the way back to really the beginning of the Neolithic in Orkney. But even further back, we now have some Mesolithic dates, going back to even about 7,000 BC. So there's activity at the nest there. It's not just one date. We now have about half a dozen. And uh, this seems to be supported, these early dates, by the discovery of Mesolithic-type flints, microliths. And uh, Dr. Hugo Anderson Weimark, he's uh, presently finishing cataloging all the flints from the nest but these ones he's selected to show you know, classic Mesolithic style uh, flint work. So, as I said, some of the radiocarbon is, uh, yes, a bit frustrating, but when we start to combine it with other techniques, then we kind of can refine things even further. And uh, one of the techniques that we've been working on or working with is archaeomagnetic dating, which uh, maps changes in the Earth's magnetic field. And this is work that's been conducted initially by Dr. Kathy Bach, who we see here, but latterly by Sam Harris. I hope to call him in the next few months Dr. Sam Harris, because he's just finished his PhD and is still madly writing up the last little bits of it. But the initial results that Sam has got from uh, his work show some very kind of positive outcomes where he is getting nice groupings that seem to fit together with some of the radiocarbon dates that we've had. And uh, hopefully the dates that he's got from the, uh, from the nest 
will help to calibrate the, the arcomagnetic curve right the way back into the Neolithic. We've had less success with other techniques, RHX, rehydroxylation dating, which uh, showed great promise about 10 years ago. It's actually dating when moisture was, well, when a pot had been fired. And as it gradually, as it ages, then it kind of takes the moisture back in. But uh, there's been problems with funding that project and also a few queries about the, how uh, workable it is. But also OSL, optically stimulated luminescence dating. Again, the dates we have from the NEST didn't quite fit in with what we have, but again, these dates were, were done in oh, 10, almost 15 years ago. And so we, something that you might uh, consider reapplying. When it comes to archaeology, archaeology is that one-off experiment. You don't get a second chance to do it. So what you have to do is try to do everything to the best of your ability. And that includes recording to the nth degree everything you're doing. So apart from the traditional written records that we do, which uh, you wouldn't believe the number that we have for the nest now, my office back at the, the, the college is literally bulging at the seams. Um, but also photography. And again, in the last 15 years, Photography has obviously came on in leaps and bounds. And I can remember when we started the nest balancing off step ladders or using kind of huge uh, poles with cameras on the top. Then, of course, we moved on. A height of sophistication, kite photography, which worked really well. I'm very grateful to Hugo Anderson Weimark once again for some of the, the shots that he did. But now we use drones, and uh, some of the results you can get are just superb. But of course the nest is just such a photogenic sight I always seem to think. But even that is uh, being augmented this year by the use of a drone with thermal infrared imaging uh, capability. And this again will be brought over by Professor Scott Pike from Willamette University and this will pick up subtleties in the kind of the, the heat that's given off by, by certain features. You can see this kind of schematic view of how certain things under the ground either radiate or don't radiate heat. The recording extends to utili utilizing some of the, you know, again, real wizardry, the black magic of technology, where we use laser scanning and also record everything that we can in three dimensions. Because what you want to be able to do is leave a site record which is reinterpretable by future generations. So every single object that we discover just about is recorded in three dimensions that all feeds into our central database. But the laser scanning is, uh, can produce beautiful, absolutely millimeter accurate plans of the site, but also uh, models that you can kind of manipulate every which way you can think of and sometimes in other ways that you've never thought of. But all the 3D imagery, I think I showed some of these slides last year, were fed into our GIS system. Massive GIS system which again uh, Crane Begg at the college is developing for us. And this is just kind of outline of the trenches. And the trenches there are coloured black not to show where the trenches are, but that's showing actually where the fines are. So when you actually zoom in, you start to see not many fines where the actual wall lines are, but everywhere else at the nest is a black dot, or several black dots. But it's only when you kind of really zoom in, you can start to work out distributions around the site of a whole range of different types of artifact. And this is proving a huge help to uh, the various specialists uh, involved in the, the NEST post-excavation. But with GIS, Global Information System, it's fantastic what you can do because you can link so many different files uh, in the computer so you can bring up pictures of what exactly has been found uh, at a particular spot. But all of those kind of 3D imagery, if you want to really see what can be done with it, have a look at Sketchfab, work again done by Hugo Anderson Weimark and also Jim Bright. 
Uh, they just type in Nessa Broadcast. And there's 3D models that you can play around with, not only of the whole trench, not just of the structures, but also some of the magnificent finds. It gets you a real kind of personal uh, intimacy with, uh, with the site. And we now use photogrammetry, basically taking lots of photographs, stitching them together in computer programs, to also replace some of that very tedious and kind of time-consuming planning that we do inside. I'm sure anybody who's visited an archaeological site will, will, will have noticed archaeologists standing there almost like statues, clutching a planning board and looking over a kind of gridded frame because we want to record everything exactly as it is. But now with photogrammetry, you can do the same uh, process in about a tenth of the time. It is truly magical. Other ways of recording is uh, regarding some of the finds. And uh, for this, we're, we've developed uh, our own reflective transformation imaging system, which uh, sounds very grand, but basically what it is, is this is a dome, which was very kindly printed out in 3D by uh, Mark Newton. Yes, I thought I missed your name off there, Mark, for a second. Uh, and the help of Jan Blatchford and her son Mark and various other people, this is a true kind of piece of wonderful technology. Because underneath all this is like a whole series of lights which all fire off in sequence. So you're lighting a single object and taking 50, 60 photographs in quick succession. But then you feed them all into this program and you can literally recreate whichever lighting process or lighting angle that you would so wish. So things like this, this is one of our decorated stones, you can really pick up the very fine uh, lines which often are not picked up in ordinary photography. Or here, this piece of pottery where you can actually work out the sequence that it was kind of decorated in. A large part of uh, what we've discovered at the nest is stone and rock. And at the nest, we've been very, very lucky because, uh, in fact, spoiled because we have our own in-house geologist, Martha Johnson, who is really, I think, for every archaeologist at the, at the nest, has really uh, transformed the way we think about rock. And uh, note this quote about the difference between <coughs> rock and stone. If you ever come to the nest and refer something to something as stone rather than rock, you will incur the wrath of Martha. Not a pretty sight. But we're also very grateful that Martha has undertaken, just finished this uh, large uh, study of the foreign, so-called foreign rock at the nest. Rock which doesn't belong from the, or from the immediate environs of the nest. And uh, Martha has very, very uh, quickly finished her PhD, I think, you know, almost a new world record, and uh, will be uh, uh, given her doctorship in September. So I think a big round of applause for her. Because I think the study that Martha has done of the rock at the nest isn't just applicable to the nest, but it is going to transform the way how stone rock, I almost said stone, rock is uh, looked at at many archaeological sites. And uh, this has not only been through you know, looking at the walls of these sometimes quite amazingly beautiful structures here, the structure 12, with some of this beautiful pet dressing, but looking at where this stone came from as well. Lots and lots of different types of stone, as Martha's discovered, has been brought to the nest from all over Orkney. And again, with some of these decorated stones, the red and yellow sandstones that uh, came from some of the, the same quarries that were used for St. Magnus's Cathedral. And we now have managed to you know, locate several of the, the quarries. There's the nest there, so only one up behind uh, Ring of Brodka, another one over in Staney Hill. This is also combined with some of the work that Professor Colin Richards uh, did. And also down here near Houghton. But, uh, 
it isn't just local stone that we've been looking at, also some of the more exotic items from the nest, for instance, pitch stone, the type of volcanic glass that comes from Arran down the west coast of Scotland. Some of the uh, axes that we've had that have came from the great Neolithic axe factories at Langdale. But also objects like this, rhodochrosite. Uh, these two, what we term uh, pillow stones or cushion stones, two from uh, the, the Ness. And rhodochrosite is a, a mineral. Martha will correct me if I'm wrong, I hope. Maybe I hope she won't. Um, that um, is always found in association with manganese. Is that close enough, Martha? Yeah. And uh, there's one major outcrop of manganese in Orkney, <coughs> and that is on the west coast of Hoy, just along from St John's Head. And it's about 60 feet down from the, the top of the cliff, and it's in a pretty inaccessible place, and you wonder why, what, you wonder if that's why this type of rock uh, was kind of quite special to the people at the nest. Because not only have we found these two pillar stones, but also last year we uncovered this uh, a polished stone mace head made from the same material. And uh, this seems to kind of confirm what we thought about the nest. It is attracting material from many, many different places, including here we see these two mace heads at the bottom made from Lewisian banded gneiss, so probably coming from the, the Western Isles of uh, Scotland. And talking of stone tools, I can't let this go by. This, these are some of the stone spatulas that have been discovered at the Ness, almost uh, unique to the Ness. And uh, very happy to announce that uh, Gary Lloyd, one of the uh, students at the college, has won our Can Canadian Vacation Scholarship uh, to study these over the summer. So good luck to Gary. I think uh, there's about 70 or 80 of them for him to catalogue and come to some conclusion about what they're used for because they are one of these strange tools which uh, don't seem to exhibit much in the way of edge damage. So what they're used for is basically anybody's guess. The structures, apart from looking at the architecture, we we'll also look at many other aspects of them, bringing science to bear. And sometimes archaeoastronomy is seen as that kind of fringe uh, aspect of uh, archaeology. But uh, work by Dougie Scott, who's I think quite well known throughout the archaeoastronomy world, uh, Dougie came up and did some preliminary work at the Ness, and he did show that uh, there are certain alignments which do have astro uh, uh, astronomical significance for the buildings. But I think uh, when it comes to looking at the, the architecture of the structures, no finer example can be, can be found than looking at the way these structures were roofed, which uh, you've probably all heard this before, but I think it's a story worth retelling, where you have these flat stone slabs, which initially we considered to be the remains of maybe a flag floor, but uh, <coughs> they are in fact the remains of one of these, a flagged stone roof. And it was only really by carefully recording each and every single one of these slabs in three dimensions and photographing them and looking at the angle that they had fallen in that uh, we managed to piece together a, a story about how the, the, the roofs would have held together. And a lot of this has been undertaken by, by Neil Ackerman. Uh, he did a, a study of it again through another Carnegie Summer v Vacation Scholarship. And uh, Neil produced some very interesting results and is presently working on a paper uh, jointly to uh, bring this to kind of world attention. But uh, it's only by looking at them and recording them and doing analysis on them that you can really see how these stone slates were used and what probably supported them. And uh, I think the conclusion is, presently, that because we haven't found any post holes in the middle of these structures, that they do seem to, seem to be supported on what seems to be a very simple A-frame truss. And if this was the case, it would be the earliest evidence anywhere for this style of roofing. But I think that there we can see possibilities of A-frames, various other purlings, but also the study showed that there were smaller slates 
occurring at either end of the building, which may suggest that the, the actual buildings had curved ends to the roofs, and no doubt supported on wood, which uh, may or may not have came from driftwood. I think driftwood is a hugely underestimated resource when it comes to looking at prehistory in places such as Orkney. But I think that work by Scott Timpany, again of the UHI, uh, some of the pollen analysis he's been doing will probably you know, augment some of the, the, the work regarding you know, the use of timber and so many other aspects of um, the, the study of finesse. And uh, the analysis that Scott's undertaking, again, is a kind of preliminary stage, but uh, showing some you know, very promising results. And again, this is being augmented by uh, some of the work he's been doing on uh, bulk flotation samples, spot samples. And a lot of this work has been undertaken by Cecily Webster. I don't know if Cecily is here tonight, but Cecily and her team, often volunteers and students, process literally hundreds of samples every year that come off the site. And Cecily quite often looks like the mud lady, but uh, she does a wonderful job. And she has one of those eyes which really can just pick up the minutiae of uh, some of the residues. So not only the, the kind of carbonized material, but also some of the very finer material. <coughs> a lot of environmental evidence also comes from the middens of the nest. And middens of the nest are not rare. We have lots of it. The middens themselves are well preserved, but often they're quite acidic. So there's a lot of material which you normally would hope to be preserved in middens isn't. But it's often kind of quite difficult in the field to actually differentiate some of the kind of very fine lenses that you see within these middens. So this is where we call in the micromorphologists. And this is Drs. Joe McKenzie and Dr. Lisa Marie Shillito. And uh, they kind of complement each other with what they've been doing. But for those who aren't micromorphologists, myself, a quick resume of what micromorphology is. If you come to the nest sometimes, you'll notice these little kind of square holes in uh, bits of the, the site. Well, these are places where the samples of micromorphology have been removed. Basically, you use a little tin, and you bang the tin in, and then very carefully extract this block of soil across the various uh, lenses or elements of stratigraphy that you're interested in. And then these are very carefully impregnated with resin and then cut into very thin sheets, which can then be studied under the microscope. And this can quite often really put a totally different complexion on what you can actually see in the field, the intricacies and minutiae of it. So looking at, for instance, deposits within houses, the floor deposits, which can give indications of how these different bits of the buildings were used, uh, to looking at, you know, phytoliths. Phytoliths are kind of silica-based bodies which actually grow in different types of uh, plants, but they survive much better than the plants themselves. But these are now being picked up by the micromorphologists. <coughs> so you can kind of identify different types of fuel use. And also lots and lots of other different types of activity uh, within that have, that have resulted in the production of this midden, or in some places just pure ash heaps. But also the work of Dr. Joe McKenzie looking at the floors of these buildings. The floors of the nest are a morass of different events. And uh, again, if you come to the nest and look at the, the floors of some of the structures, you'll see all these little holes that have been dug. Joe calls them her little hamster holes. Uh, but uh, they, here you can see one of her tins being put into the floor, but you can see here the number of different elements or different events that are represented in these floor levels. Well, there looks enough there, there's probably, I could probably count about 20 different events there, but under the microscope you're probably looking at many, many dozens more. So it gives you an idea of how these structures were used, how different bits of them were used. And the uh, the micromorphologists 
are also kind of relying or complementing the work in the building of Professor Scott Pike. And he's got another one of these wonderful bits of wizardry, portable XRF machine, looks a bit like a, a Star, Trek, Star Trek phaser gun, <coughs> but uh, it is a non-destructive analytical method that allows you to determine the chemical makeup of uh, soils or uh, material adhering to, for instance, this big, what we thought was a large quern stone. But by carefully plotting out the different uh, densities of all these materials, such as strand, strontium and rhodium and a whole host of other elements, you can start to see patterns emerging across the floors. And for instance, in Structure 8, some of the early work that Scott did, we started to see that very high densities of, uh, here we see, which one's that? Rhod rhodium and phosphorus occurring in one of the little side recesses. And this side recess is interesting because this is one of the ones that was defined by this upright slab with these two, what we term, cat flaps in it. I don't think they were cat flaps, but um, <coughs> they may give indications about the, why you have this high density of phosphorus there. But since these initial results, we've had various students working on it, and they produce much more artistic uh, distribution plots of uh, this kind of elemental work. Here we just see one example from part of structure 14, and this is, I think, copper. Uh, but as we can build up a whole picture of this and then look at the different phases and how these change over time, it does show that these structures you know, function in different ways. The analysis is not just on floors, not just on the middens, but also on things like the paint. And uh, we're very lucky that we've had Professor Mimi Bueno, uh, I love that name, Mimi Bueno, she's a lovely woman from, uh, I think, Madrid University, who's done a lot of work on some of the chambered tombs in Iberia and Brittany. And she used the same techniques with uh, some of the stones which we suspected had been artificially coloured at the nest. And I was very relieved to hear when Mimi uh, came up with the conclusion that yes, the, the stones at the nest were equally decorated with uh, uh, artificial colour. But also the work of uh, Chloe, Chloe Berghausen, uh, using a different type of method, a new type of photography, de-stretch photography. I won't go into that now, but look it up on the web, fascinating uh, process. Um, but also colour, colour applying appearing in the pots. Here we can see it quite clearly, I think, you know, in the top one, this kind of white slip with kind of red additions, and this one where you have a red clay that's been applied. And uh, again, this is Cecily, a uh, flotation supremo. She is also a wonderful artist and produced these uh, reconstructions of what grooved where pottery might have looked like when, when it was poorly coloured. But on a more scientific level, uh, we've been working closely with Dr. Richard Jones at Glasgow University and some of his colleagues. And he's uh, utilised a whole range of uh, different scientific techniques. Don't ask me what they all do, but uh, he's managed to identify that most of the reds are uh, identified as kind of resulting from the use of iron-rich pigments, whether it's ochre or hematite. Black is basically carbon. But the white that we see, well, that caused us a few problems. And uh, it, it does seem to have been prepared from bone that had been crushed up and then applied to create this kind of pigment. So for those of you who want to find out more, there's a, a forthcoming article that we wrote, uh, with, along with Roy Towers, obviously, our own in-house hot expert. And that will be coming out probably in the next six months in the Journal of Archaeological Science. Talking of pot, we also like to know what they did with the pot. So uh, a few years ago, we got some lipid analysis, looking at you know, an, uh, analysis of the, 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 uh, the residues uh, within the pottery. And this was work done by Lisa Shillito, Lucy Cramp, and Richard Everett. And uh, surprise, surprise, there was a dominance of cattle, cattle remains in the pottery, it had been used for cooking, whether it was milk fats, cattle fats, but it emphasised that what we're seeing at the nest is very different to what you're seeing at contemporary sites down south, 
where pink is a much more kind of common uh, occurrence in pottery. But the little pilot study that, that was undertaken then is hopefully, fingers crossed, soon to be augmented by a much larger project. It's a grant application that uh, we just put in, a massive grant took years to put together with uh, Professor Ollie Craig down at York and Professor Mark Edmonds here and uh, Anne McSween from HAS. But uh, this project, Pots and People, if, it, if we do get the funding, it will be amazing because we're going to be analysing over a thousand shards of ceramic from the nest from different areas of the site, from different depths, but it should give us a real insight into how different areas develop, but also allowing us to do inter and intra-site uh, studies of uh, residues and ceramics. But that is going to include lots of work. Don't ask me what all that does, but it works. <coughs> um, animal bone as well. Animal bone, we're lucky again in Orkney that we have uh, one of the world experts, Dr. Ingrid Mainland, working in the Archaeology Institute. And uh, as we all know, animal bones can give us huge insights into archaeological sites and past societies, whether it's kind of looking at the breed, the body size, etc., uh, etc. Et There's so many different aspects of, of animal bone studies, but also looking at you know, more difficult things to maybe pick up, herding uh, regimes, traction, production of wool, meat, milk, etc., etc. And of course, of great relevance to the nest, fruit and feasting. But it's one of the things that we don't lack at the nest either. Uh, we have well over 100,000. Um, well over 100,000 fragments of animal bone from the, from the nest. Uh, so a huge uh, assemblage which should, as we study it more and more, is giving up more and more uh, secrets. And this is nowhere clearer than uh, the animal bone deposit around Structure 10, which I'm sure you've all heard about on television from myself many, many occasions. But it's worth showing you some of the, the, the new work. So by carefully recording this massive bone deposit, uh, particularly in these kind of various almost test pits, you can start to see that the density of animal bone here in this slide here, that is all animal bone, and not just a single layer, but multi-layered animal bone. And uh, initially what uh, Ingrid and her team did was looking at just the general things, species, elements, body size, age, uh, size, stature, but also looking at you know, how the animal died, the butchery, the marrow cracking, the fragmentation and the amount of burning <coughs> of the bone. But we were still missing a real great trick here because it wasn't until we really uh, employed a new technique, smart fauna, which was developed in-house at the thing, which was basically using laser scanning and a whole range of other techniques to record in great detail every single bone and how it lay in the ground that we got to understand how what this uh, bone deposit represented. You're looking at a massive amount of bone, perhaps somewhere in the region of four to 600 cattle. But you record every bone and then you put all the information together. And this is usually what you end up with, just a very simple plan, a one dimensional representation of what that deposit might signify. But in fact, when you start applying the smart fauna to it, you can see this 3D element of the, of the bone. So you can look at it in different layers, different types of bone, the orientation of the bone. I can't remember why I put that slide in. Um, but everything, and it's only through that that we managed to disentangle how this bone deposit was created. So it wasn't just a massive dump, it was something much, much more structured, much, much more deliberate. But uh, the analysis didn't stop there. We've had uh, <coughs> new people working on it, uh, Justin Ayers, who's uh, just doing another stint up here. He was up here last summer. And uh, this is kind of one of the basic uh, graphs looking at the size of the, the, the cattle tibia. And there it showed that 
you can see most of the, the nest cattle kind of are gathered here, <coughs> quite low down, whereas this is Mesolithic cattle or auric up at the top. These auric being these huge monumental uh, cattle. But there is one tibia that he looked at, which is very much up there. And I think what we have to do probably is look at some isot uh, some DNA or whatever to see, in fact, as they've discovered up at the links in Oakland and Westry, whether in fact this is just a very large domestic cow, or whether in fact it is some type of interbred uh, auric come domestic beast. And uh, yesterday I was also uh, allowed to use this slide by Umberto Albara from Sheffield, and uh, this is kind of doing a comparison between what's been found on the nest and what's been found down at Durrington Walls, a big kind of Neolithic site near Scarabray. Again, you can see the overlap very much between the two. We've done uh, isotope analysis, which again, I will just skip through because I'm just aware I've been wittering on for far too long. But basically, the isotope analysis that we have done is showing kind of that possibly the, most of the cows did originate in Orkney. They weren't as uh, you know, brought up from Stonehenge or anywhere else, as some people had surmised. But uh, we are able, through the isotope analysis, able to look at differences in uh, husbandry compared with uh, you know, later periods like Minehow and uh, also at Pool when you look at some of the Viking material there. But Again, we're, putting, we're just about to apply for another big grant application through the Leaf Hume Trust, and this is going to be called the Company of Cattle, which will look at all of this material in, again, a lot more detail, bringing lots and lots of further types of analysis, biometric analysis, 3D modelling, etc. And again, uh, Ingrid and her team have assured us that there's such a huge amount. In fact, we say that we'll even be able to tell the colour of the cows. So, but I think that's the end. Thank you all for listening. And uh, as ever, thank you to a huge number of people for supporting the NES. And if you want to help, if you haven't helped before, please consider donating through one of our websites, the American Friends of the Nessa Brodka or the Nessa Brodka Trust to charities. But also on behalf of OES, I'd also like to thank the number of uh, people who have contributed to the raffle tonight. Northlink, Michael Sinclair, Orton 3D, etc., etc., etc. All very generous. So good luck to you all with your raffle tickets. But you may also be aware that uh, before I start answering questions, hopefully there'll be one or two, I'd like to announce that tonight we launch this. Nessa Brodga Legacy. This is bottle number one. And this has been uh, signed by the chief distiller at Highland Park. So I think I recognise my scroll on it too, unfortunately. But this is a one-off bottle, the very first one. And as from Monday, you'll be able to purchase bottles at the Highland Park shop in Kirkhope. But that will necessitate coming along to uh, a special event over the weekend in Stenes School. But um, seeing this is such a special bottle, reckon uh, that I think what we should do is have an auction. <laughs> so I hope you've all brought your check or great rewards of cash. Because uh, I've been told that we should start the bidding off at a minimum of a hundred pounds. <laughs> so we will start. £100 here. 120 £150. Anyone? No, £150. Most of these bottles, they, they double in price overnight, they say. <laughs> Honest. So 150? Anyone else? What's this? 170. 170? Any more? 170? 
200. 220, anyone? It's an absolute snip. I haven't tasted it myself yet, but it's maybe absolutely delicious. 220. 250. Two hundred and fifty. Oh, good. Two hundred and seventy. Last chance. Oh, oh. Don't. I think I saw this hand first. Two seventy. Is that? Two seventy. Any increase? Two seventy. Two eighty. No, 280? Any advance in 280? No, don't want to be here all night. <laughs> 270 then. Going? 280. Sorry, 280. You can see why I'm an archaeologist. 280 down here. 300. <laughs> no advance. Going. Going. Gone. Surprise at the end of the lecture. That was a wonderful lecture uh, on the technical and scientific aspects and application of the Nessa Gold Cup. We were all very enlightened by that, for sure. By the same token, many of you have some questions. So, Nick, we will to take a few questions now. So, you'd like to you'd like to ask one by a show of hands. Stick your hand up. Did everybody hear the question? Yeah. Um, there's, the, again, it, the, the, well, the nest appears to have been deliberately covered at the end. There's a whole sequence of uh, events where you see some of the structures, particularly structure 10, apart from that big bone deposit being placed around about it, slightly later date, the inside of it is completely collapsed, deliberately collapsed, I believe and infilled with quite deliberate layers of midden and rubble, rubble and midden. They're almost creating a kind of mound, a cairn, out of the, the centre of this building, almost commemorating it. Uh, but some of the other structures, again, you see deliberate de demolition, deliberate robbing of the stone, but then again, the insides of some of the, or all of the structures, are filled in with not just a tonne or two of midden, but tens of probably thousands of tonnes of midden. In fact, they're covering the whole site. And some of the, the analysis that's been done through micromorphology, looking at the way how some of those middens have built up at the end, some of it does seem to be happening in quite, uh, not just single individual uh, kind of basketfuls, but kind of major events. So at the end, I think whatever had maintained the nest for over a thousand years, or at least well, that's another story I won't go into. But the nest had been uh, <coughs> deliberately obliterated. There was kind of an attempt to maybe erase it, but also you creating this huge mound, a mound which uh, was, you know, probably with the most prominent feature in the whole landscape for the next three, four thousand years up until the 19th century. 
Okay, other questions? I think, I think it's always the, the, the concern that it's trying to manipulate that data. I don't think you can ever have too much data, but it does sometimes swamp you. But I think by, by using things like the, the GIS, it's such a wonderful tool. If we had this information you know, 30 years ago, I, I think you really would be just totally lost. But then you wouldn't be able to generate all that, that information in the first place. But I think by, by careful use of that, and when, when you see how so many disciplines who are involved in archaeology all kind of knit together and grow together and communicate, then you, you're, you're utilising the information from lots and lots of different uh, disciplines to actually build that bigger picture. So there may be certain things that you kind of think back, you know, maybe if it did it a different way, but I don't think you can ever have too much information. But even if it's information that you might not use in actually writing up the site in the end, I think because it is that one-off experiment, what I think every archaeologist wants to do is leave a, a record which can be reused or reinterpreted by future generations, is probably their, their techniques and technology will you know, put out as well and truly in the shade. So I would say that no. But, uh, it's, it's sometimes thought about. I've got a question. Yeah. yeah. So I've got two questions actually. Um, as you said, it was uh, the site was buried. They were really. So was there any speculation as to why it was buried? Was it some sort of ritual? And secondly, was there any like uh, post activity after the Neolithic? That's my question. So I did catch the, the second one. And was there any? Is there any activity post Neolithic? Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll answer the second one first. Um, the, the nest was revisited by, by, by later uh, people. Um, for instance, in Trench T, the, the, the big midden mound, there's a later Iron Age ditch dug around the top of it. And you, you find this quite often in various Neolithic sites like Quantin S, and oh, probably, you've probably even got it down with the Cairns, I bet, where sites are revisited again and again, and they're kind of reinterpreted. Even at the Stones of Stoness, when the Stones of Stoness was excavated back in the 1970s, they discovered Iron Age pottery in a pit in the middle of it. Um, so there is further activity, and there's even kind of Viking activity. There's uh, the, the site, or the, somewhere on the Ness is meant to be the site of a, a major Viking skirmish. Um, so yeah, there was lots of things happening. Uh, but when it comes to the end of the nest, you're looking at, you could say that the end of the nest equates with the end of the Neolithic equals the beginning of the Bronze Age. Because what we find just above that big bone deposit is classic early Bronze Age. One shirt of beaker pottery and one barbed and tanged arrowhead. But I don't think that that equation, that simplistic equation of saying end of the Neolithic equals start of the Bronze Age equals end of the, the, the Vanessa Brodka. I think there's lots of other things feeding into that. So there's lots of other, possibly even your climatic change. I think there's, there's lots of different things. But I think it's, it's basically it's, it's a different social order. Society had moved on. Whatever had maintained the Neolithic society and made it probably one of the most prominent parts of the, the Neolithic in Britain. It was eclipsed and things had moved elsewhere. And yeah, lots of different theories about why that happened. But uh, I think um, th there was things which were very important to the Neolithic people, but when you start looking at what was uh, changes happening at the beginning of the Bronze Age, the Beaker period, etc., society was different, people were different, they valued different things. And I don't think Orkney managed to maintain itself with those new, new ideas. You maybe even resisted those new ideas. Lady there in the white t-shirt. White gloves. Um, what's the long term plan for the Did everyone hear that? Shall I repeat that? No. Second question, what's the long term plan for the Nets? Um, the, the long term depends on how you define long term. <coughs> I always thought long term, 10 years ago, was, was the next season of excavation. 
about uh, th this phase of the excavation, what, what you see, the, those major buildings, uh, we will uh, continue excavating them until we uh, have, have looked at all the different phases of construction, reconstruction, and how they were used. Uh, but some of those buildings, as you'll see, you know, the walling in them is just exquisite. It's something, you know, we could easily take that away to look at what lies underneath. But I think that the Ness is such a vast site that we can probably answer some of those questions by doing almost keyhole surgery elsewhere. But in the longer term, we can't leave the Ness open, even if we we'll leave it open for just one winter. Because of the nature of the stone, it's not like the, the beach stone that you see at Scarrow Bray, all, all, all of the, the stone, most of the stone of the Ness is all quarried stone. And when that's left open, water starts to get into the laminations and it, you'd just be left with a pile of rubble. So I think it will eventually come a time, maybe in the not too distant future, and decided it's not just my decision, but I think the site will have to be covered over again. And uh, I think, as I said, we can still kind of continue the story of the Ness by, by various means, whether that's through augmented reality, virtual reality, a whole range of different things. But I think that the, the Ness hopefully will never be, be forgotten because it is such an integral part of what the World Heritage Site is all about. <coughs> Time for one more, maybe if someone has a, a yearn. Yearn. So let me close it here, covering it up. You know, more some form of building. We're close as soon as gets or whatever. Um, it has been suggested that we build something like uh, an Eden uh, project dome across the thing, but I don't think we would be ever allowed planning permission for that. Also, if you were going to build something like that, you'd have to excavate a little, very large percentage of the site to actually find somewhere to put down the foundations. But personally speaking, I, I would also be dead against it because I think it would totally transform the whole landscape. I think that there's, there's other ways in this kind of technological age of preserving the site through record, as we do with the excavation, but also in the kind of virtual world, either online or maybe having some form of uh, visitor centre somewhere where people can still experience the, the wonders of the Ness. Okay, well thanks Nick, thanks very much. Yeah.